Is quant trading gambling? When I first started studying math and statistics, I heard this idea being thrown around left and right. Trading is just another form of gambling. And as I got more involved in the space, I started to reject the premise more and more. In this video, what I wanna do is I wanna talk about the idea of gambling, why it has negative connotations, why it should have negative connotations, and this idea of games of chance versus games of incomplete information and how games of incomplete information are actually quite similar to this idea of trading or quant trading or any form of algorithmic trading and what we can learn from gambling in those games of incomplete information. First, let's discuss this idea of a game of chance. Now, a game of chance, I'm painting with broad strokes here, is anytime you make a wager on an outcome with a fixed probability, you're playing a game of chance. So you can construct some sort of game with a coin flip where you're betting on heads and tails. You can construct some sort of game with a dice roll where you're betting on the outcome of the dice roll. Or you could even go to a casino and play something like roulette. In any of those cases, you're playing a game of chance. Now, in its purest form, I consider this to be gambling, and I also consider this to be where all of the negative connotation should go, and for good reason. So first, let's take a look at something like roulette. What I've done here is I've simulated a bunch of wealth paths of playing roulette from the perspective of the casino. So anytime you make a bet in roulette, there's a fixed payout structure, but of course, it's not purely 50-50. You still have the zeros. So in this case, if you're to simulate the wealth from the casino's perspective, these are a bunch of different potential outcomes. So you can see five sample paths here. You have this blue and gold path, which accumulate a lot more wealth relative to this green and pink path. And even in this case, if you take a look at the green path, the casino actually lost money, even though it has this edge. The theoretical edge is plotted as a red dashed line, so this is what is meant when it says the house always wins. This is why, because this is a thousand games, the casino in the worst path that was generated from this simulation is almost net zero, where its best path, it's up quite a significant amount over the theoretical value. So these games of chance, they are in favor of the house. If you are a player playing these games of chance, you're gambling on an outcome where if you iteratively play this game, you are essentially destined to lose all of your money. And that's because the house has this theoretical edge. So over time, you're going to just accumulate loss until you eventually run out of money. Whereas the house, if it was able to play indefinitely or extend itself credit, it would theoretically never run out of money from this perspective. So this is why gambling tends to have negative connotations and rightfully so, because if I choose to engage in roulette and I continue to play, eventually I'm gonna run out of money unless I choose to stop at some sort of threshold, but that turns into the gambler's ruin problem. That's a video topic for another day. So if that's a game of chance and I consider that to be gambling, then what do I consider poker? Well, isn't poker the pinnacle of gambling? If somebody said they were a poker player, wouldn't you just interchangeably call them a gambler? Yes and no. So what I'm trying to say here is in the context of a game of chance, there is no optimal decision to make. If I bet on green or bet on red or bet on black and roulette, nobody would tell me, oh, that's, that's a great move. It's a great move. No, because the outcome is purely random according to some sort of fixed probability mass function. But in the context of something like poker, you might say, wow, that's a great bluff, or wow, that's a great fold, or that's a good call. And when we start to think about how that actually carries some weight, we're kind of moving away from this idea of purely just a game of chance, and we're moving into this space of optimal decision-making in uncertainty. And that's what is meant in this context of a, a game of incomplete information. Sure, you can call it gambling because you're placing money on uncertain outcomes. Fair enough. But really, I'm trying to focus on this idea of optimal decision making in uncertainty. You have an environment in which it is inherently uncertain. You have incomplete information about it and you have to act. 
If you get dealt a hand of cards, you have to decide, are you going to fold? Are you going to call? Are you going to raise? You have decisions to make. You don't have all of the information, and the environment is inherently random. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about a game of incomplete information relative to a game of chance. One of my favorite ways to understand this idea is to borrow a concept from reinforcement learning called the Bellman equation. Now, reinforcement learning is a field of artificial intelligence concerned with training AI agents to make optimal actions in an environment. So they're choosing how to act in an environment, and that environment may be inherently random. So to accomplish this, we can deploy the Bellman equation. Essentially, we provide it the state of the environment. So in poker, we could think of something like hands, the flop, our opponents, our bankroll. We also provide it a set of actions. We can call, we can raise, we can check, we can fold. And based on these actions, we're going to see some sort of reward in the form of making money or losing money. And that's our reward function. If we have all of these well-defined, then we can put all of these pieces together and come up with some sort of solution to that Bellman equation, theoretically, and we are going to be able to discern what action to take in this phase of uncertainty based on the current state. So when we deploy this as a solution to that problem, we are learning something, right? If I was to try to deploy this to roulette instead of poker, my agent, my AI agent, wouldn't learn anything. It's not gonna learn, hey, it's better to bet on black here, better to bet on green here. It's purely a game of chance. There is no optimal decision to make. But in the context of poker, betting your entire bankroll pre-flop is probably suboptimal. Otherwise, you would see a lot of people do it on the tour. But you certainly don't see that. So. That's a, a very interesting way, I think, to also understand this problem space is when you're dealing with games of incomplete information, you are responsible for your own edge versus a game of chance where the house gets to set the edge for themselves and for you, the player. Trading, just like poker, is a game of incomplete information. You have a series of actions that you can take and you're faced with a whole bunch of uncertainty. Now, trading is certainly much more chaotic. You have a lot of information affecting your environment. You have, just to name a few macro factors, inflation, interest rates, you have administration or administrations in the international markets, the US government policy regulation. You have things like industry trajectory, technology advancements, ad adoptions of products firm specific trajectories, a firm's cash flows, their CEO earnings, their products that they're developing. And the only thing that is certain in this space is that your interpretation and your model is incorrect. And even if it is even close to correct, then it is subject to change at any given time. Hopefully you've been watching my videos for quite some time. I always harp on this idea that your model is incorrect, but it does not preclude you from making money. You can check out my video, how to trade or how to trade option implied volatility that goes into more depth into that idea. But theoretical edge in this capacity certainly exists in tandem with the model interpretation. Otherwise, why would you use that model if there was not even any theoretical edge in a perfect laboratory? If you can't make money, then how on earth are you going to make money in the real world? Building off this idea, we can start to consider this idea of experience. So we have a model which we know is incorrect, but as a trader, you experience the true environment all of the time. You start to get an idea of how you want to act optimally in the face of different types of uncertainty. If uncertainty is extremely high, maybe you choose to hedge. Maybe you double down, depending on a variety of different factors. Now, in this same vein, you'll often hear that historic data has no impact on future events, so we should maybe disregard it or not use it, and you know maybe we shouldn't use it for trading and, and what have you. And I'll say there's some truth to that in discerning different levels of statistical quantities, but in this argument, what I'm saying is that historic data is certainly useful to learn information about behavior and optimal behavior in uncertainty. Extending this argument into the academic literature, if you take a look at any of Hans Bueller's work, he deploys this Bellman equation to learn to hedge optimally. 
And there's a, a great note called Deep Bellman Hedging. I'll, I'll leave it in the description below for you to check out. But if this data didn't merit any experiential learning, then that algorithm would not have learned any information. It would have just been a game of chance. And that's certainly not the case. Now that we've established that your decisions impact your theoretical edge and that there is structure to learn in these random environments, we can start to look at the different decision levers available to us and draw some very interesting analogies. So in poker, for example, we can call raise fold uh, in trading, we can hedge, hold, or increase our position size. Those are very, very similar actions to take in each game of uncertainty. Moreover, you have bet sizing and trade sizing, and you're going to have to decide if you are going to increase the stakes, what those stakes are going to be. Now, this is learned through experience. And in the context of AI, you can simulate these environments or use historic data to train an AI agent in this capacity. But that's exactly the purpose of this video and why I'm so opposed to the idea that trading and even poker to some extent is just pure gambling because the wager and the probabilities are not tied to a fixed expected value. And something like roulette that is certainly the case. The, the house has the edge, but in poker and trading, your actions determine whether or not you have a positive edge and whether or not you can accumulate that expected value over time in the form of PL. Once we accept the fact that our optimal decision making in the face of this uncertainty is entirely in our own hands, we're faced with a lot of challenges because in the human aspect, we have emotion, we're concerned about losing money, we're not necessarily as happy gaining money as we are upset when we lose money. There's a lot of psychological literature to support this idea. In the context of quant trading too, though, just because you implement something that is algorithmic and not emotional, it does not mean that it's arbitrarily better because you're probably going to be trading with some sort of fixed set of rules that are certainly going to change over time. So if you do deploy some sort of algorithm to make trading decisions for you, it may not be able to adapt to the environment fast enough for you to make those optimal decisions in uncertainty. If you're sitting behind the desk buying, selling, that's very adaptive. You can immediately increase, decrease your position size, whatever it is. If you're going with a low touch system, then you don't have that capacity. Maybe some sort of blend of the two could exist, and, and it certainly does, but it's just very important to consider. There's, there's fundamentally things flawed with all of these approaches. Algorithmic and quant trading isn't just arbitrarily better than discretionary trading, it's different. And these strategies that you deploy are going to change over time, certainly. So this is an ever-changing landscape. But what does that mean for our theoretical edge? Well, we're taking the action and we are impacting our theoretical edge. So even if you come up with some sort of strategy and trade it perfectly, maybe theoretically there is edge, but you just got a whole bunch of bad luck. You could certainly end up as this green path and all of these have a positive drift, but there's nothing saying that you can't have positive expected value and a streak of terrible luck and lose a whole bunch of money either. So it's a very difficult environment to discern whether or not you are trading in an effective way, whether or not your trading strategy actually has an edge, whether or not it's you and you're making these trades in a discretionary capacity and you're just concerned and not timing it correctly in this or that or that, or maybe it's the regime and there's structural changes and your strategies, alpha has decayed and whatnot and this and that, but it's the same thing in an algorithmic capacity too. So should we exhibit behavior and action in an optimal capacity in the face of uncertainty, then we should see theoretically, we should see some sort of accumulation of positive expected value over time in the form of positive PL. but that does not preclude us from also losing money if it is in fact positive. So is quant trading gambling? Well, in this video, I've argued that the idea and negative connotation of gambling should be associated with a game of chance, that is outcomes that are purely probabilistic in that you have no action to take to affect the theoretical edge. So something like roulette, one party sets that edge, that party is the house, you're subject to that edge when you play the game, versus something like trading or poker, 
when you play those games, you are subject to setting your own edge based on how you act in different states of uncertainty. It's very important to keep this stuff in mind as you enter the trading space. It's non-trivial. It's very difficult to quantify edge, quantify if your strategy is even productive, if you've been terribly lucky or terribly unlucky. But one thing that I wanted to close this video out with is this idea of, of technical trading and technical analysis. A lot of folks will draw lines on charts, they'll use moving averages, they'll use standard deviations, support and resistance levels, liquidity levels, what, what have you. And I want to suggest that, you know, <laughs> that type of trading can't be proven or disproven. Just like any other trading strategy, maybe it works really, really well at one point in time for whatever reason, and you make a ton of money, but it doesn't work in a systematic capacity. When you backtest some sort of moving average crossover strategy, it does terribly. But, you know, oh, it, it worked for me during this time. And, and that's certainly the case. That's why there is no, oh, I can just prove that technical analysis doesn't work or drawing a line on a chart doesn't work because it certainly can work and very, very well for specific securities at specific points in time. And over time, maybe more and more people trade that and that goes away or maybe it comes back as less people trade that strategy. So it's important to understand and keep in mind that this landscape changes. And the only thing that is certain is your model's wrong. But as we've said this entire time, that certainly does not preclude you from making money. That's gonna do it for this video on quant trading and gambling. I hope you've enjoyed, I hope you learned something. If you'd like to see more videos like this one in the future, please subscribe, like, leave a comment. Feel free to join our Discord, ping me in general, let me know your thoughts. And other than that, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.